The following podcast is not relating to my teachings and work at Del Cedar Medical Center and is for entertainment purposes only. Hello, hello, everybody. Another episode of Life of Flow here uh, with Lucas and Miguel. We're talking to Christensen Martin today. Christensen Martin is a business development specialist slash strategist. I would think that he is a very um, an entrepreneur um, at, at heart. And today, um, amongst other things, we'll be talking a lot about <clears throat> one of his latest projects, which is called the Sacred Healing Center. And uh, Christensen was essentially a retreat director and coordinator. And, and I think through his own stories and through the stories of others, and you'll see how he relates a lot of this journey he's been in, uh, I think it just throws a very interesting message of, of one that for all of us in this grind, we, we tend to forget sometimes. And, and I think uh, it's, it's worth listening. It's worth listening. Give it a little bit of time. Um, I know that a lot of you may, may have this initial visceral reaction to say, okay, well, this is a little bit too crazy. But listen through. <laughs> listen through because there is a message to be told. There is a stillness to be found in our lives. And I think we're all needing a lot more of what he has to give. Um, so I really am inviting you. I'm asking you to stick around and listen in because I, I thought it was a very interesting and enlightening show. Yeah, this was by far one of the most interesting episodes that we've done. Um, I, I love this topic. So this was, I mean, for me personally, just being here, having this conversation with Christensen uh, was amazing. And I hope, I hope people enjoy and have an open mind. All right, join us. Two vascular surgeons walk into a bar and come out with a podcast. We are talking everything vascular and not. Welcome to the Life of Flow podcast. All right, Christensen, it's great to have you here uh, with us. Uh, welcome to another program of the Life of Flow. Uh, here with my co-host, you don't know him personally. Hopefully you will at some point in the future. Uh, but this is Lucas Ferrer and uh, you know, welcome. Thanks for sharing with our, uh, with our listeners. Yeah, thank you guys for inviting me. Really a pleasure to be here on my first podcast ever. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Good. Well, listen, I'll, 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 let me make it easy for you. Forget that we're even recording. This is us three having a, a beer at a bar and talking, kicking some shit around because that's what exactly this podcast is. It is for entertainment purposes only. We're not giving medical advice, lifestyle advice, nothing like that. So you're seeking that, get the fuck out. This is not your podcast. <laughs> this is us talking about stuff that we find interesting. So I'll give a quick background. Through acquaintances, uh, business, and entrepreneurial, um, I ended up in a table uh, sharing, uh, you know, breaking bread with Christensen. Uh, and, uh, you know, and anyway, we were talking about medical grade gloves. Okay. <laughs> But the conversation started going in so many directions because Christensen... I think is the entrepreneur at heart. Like if I have met somebody that just embodies that, I, and, and by the way, this comes from somebody that's met this guy for like an hour. Okay. Yeah. <laughs> But it was just like, man, within one very short period of time, he told me of all these different endeavors that he's done, mm -hmm. places in the world that he's been to, uh, but things that he's visited. And uh, it, it was just so, It was so refreshing, I'll say. It was refreshing in the context of what our boring business meetings are. They're usually these, the same people that went to the same colleges, that have the same degrees, that have the same mentality. That it's, but Christensen has a much more global uh, perspective on life, and I thought it was cool. And, uh, and what I was more and more interested in that I would love to talk about here was that one of his multiple endeavors And, and businesses is that he was running a company that would essentially tailor to private um, psychedelic journeys and therapy experiences in different parts of Latin America. And uh, 
And 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 that's kind of what I wanted to talk about today because I I felt that was really cool. And I'm sure there's got to be some fucking stories here. Yeah. <laughs> and this is non rehearsed. I don't know anything about what he's about to tell us. <laughs> so I'm just very tickled by, by how he got here. So Christensen, welcome. And uh, you know, set the stage, man. How do you come up with an idea that all of a sudden you're going to be a concierge to to this very you know we by the way we've had on the show professors of um of medicine that run therapy medically indicated under guidelines of FDA psychedelic therapy so i am a firm believer that the world is going to be a better place as we understand how to use this to our betterment um and so i i think this is actually very lots of foresight of you to have been in a way in, in a world where you were providing this at a stage where still they may they may be a lot more science and guardrails to to build but tell me a little bit about how what led you to start this and, and how the idea come about. Yeah, well, uh, it, it, I think it started around college. Uh, I, w- I was uh, going to NYU Dental School. I was in my first semester when I was uh, diagnosed with ulcerative colitis, and so it's an idiopathic disease. Nobody knows how to cure it, and uh, nobody knows how you get it. And so I was just uh, under me- medication. I was taking prednisone, steroids. I thought my life was over. <laughs> and uh, and then the doctor told me that they had to give me a complete colectomy. You know, So I had a complete removal of my large intestine. And uh, as you guys can just kind of formulate, it was a lot of suffering going through that. And so uh, through that time, I, I, I was near the border of death. And so I thought like there has to be something more important to life than just me trying to climb up the accolades of success and uh, and money, you know, which is what I had in my mind at the time when I was about 23 years old. Um, and so at that time, I remember uh, speaking, I went to Mexico and that's where I had my surgery. My brother was in uh, medical school in Monterey, Mexico. And that's where I met a lot of his friends who were also in medical school. And, uh, and uh, people in Mexico, it's a different culture. Like everybody's just uh, very open and they would tell me like, um, uh, first, it, it started with, with marijuana, actually. They told me, like, look, if you want to get rid of your pain, you want to have some appetite, smoke a little bit of marijuana. And so I smoked it, and I was like, oh, okay, this is good. It helps a lot. Um, and so I was into, I'm, I'm very against taking medication just because it's just so harsh on the body. And so I always try to find alternatives to that. Um, and so in the process, my friends would tell me, like, oh, go to this little small town. You'll, you'll find peyote. And if you go to this other place over here in Mexico, you're going to find mushrooms. And this other place, uh, a man in a town will sell you like this whole bag of weed for like 50 pesos. <laughs> and so I was like, okay, I'm going to go try it out. So every time I would, uh, once I recovered, I uh, I started, anytime I got a little bit of money, instead of buying myself material possessions, I would just go travel. I would go somewhere. And, uh, and in that process, I, I ended up meeting a lot of shamans. Um, and so I, I ended up doing the whole shamanic journey. I went to... Uh, do peyote in the desert. I went do, to go do the the holy children, the mushrooms down in Oaxaca, and uh, I also met um, uh, the huicholes. The, it's like a sh- shamanic tribe that they partake in the peyote ceremonies, uh, and they explained to me about the medicine, what it does, what it does to your mind, to your body, and I ended up learning a lot about that. Um, and then eventually it led to me going down to, uh, Peru and doing ayahuasca. And, uh, and then the, the final medicine that I ever did was the, the DMT, uh, which is derived from the parotid gland of a toad, uh, up in, uh, in Sonora, uh, Mexico, the northern part of Mexico. And, uh, and I, I noticed through all these uh, shamanic experiences that like all these sacred medicines, they had a common element and, they all led you to um, the sacred space. And the sacred space was kind of uh, just a holy space. And it wasn't until uh, I did uh, the DMT. DMT is different than all the other sacred medicines because you actually separate your yourself from the body. And what I mean by yourself is your consciousness. You know, and, uh, and whether it's peyote, mushroom, ayahuasca, you're still very conscious that you're in the body and that you're going through this experience that's very exalted. Uh, but DMT is the one that just, uh, you kind of just go into uh, outer space, into another thing. And I remember that ceremony very clearly. I, I remember the shaman. He, he was also a doctor. His name is uh, Octavio. He, he travels around Mexico and around Europe to give this medicine. 
Uh, and so when I took the medicine, he tells me, okay, count from 20 down. And I said, 20, 19, 18, as I was smoking a, a pipe that he was holding for me. And uh, when I got to 18, I felt like this venom running through my body. And I and the last thought I had was like, oh, shit, I'm dead. Like, <laughs> this is death. <laughs> and right when I have that thought, I just like, boom, collapse. And, and what kept going was the consciousness. And in this consciousness, it just went through a tunnel like... <sighs> And then it hits nothingness. And in that nothingness, all I could feel it was this unconditional love, just like squashing me and compressing me to nothing. <laughs> nothing existed, not my family, not my problems, not even me. And, uh, and it was very quick. And as I, I started to come back into the body, it felt like a shell that I was coming back into. The shaman was putting uh, water in my face and it felt like liquid metal just like streaming across and as I started regaining consciousness, I saw his assistant was hitting my feet on the ground. I was on the ground without a shirt. The, the shaman was just singing his chants. And, uh, and when I got out of it, I was in, in shock. I, I asked the shaman, like, what was that? Like, what did I just go through? I, I wasn't even expecting to go through this experience uh, based on my experience of all the other sacred medicines. And uh, my other friend, she had just done it like 15 minutes prior. And I, and once I looked to her, I said, I, I get it now. Like this whole reality, it's about God. Like that's all it is. It's like, it's just God. Like it doesn't matter what you're doing in this world. That's really the, the more, most important thing. And so that's when my heart started seeking more into spirituality. Um, I was invited in 2013 by a friend. Um, he was an Italian guy that was a yogi. Right. He told me, if you want to go through an exotic experience, uh, let me invite you over here to India. He's like, I'm part of uh, this group of monks, and uh, they're called the Nagababas. And so I went over there uh, to this festival called Kumbh Mela. Uh, Kumbh Mela is the largest festival in the world. It's about 130 million people, and they get together every three years along the Ganges. And they've been doing this for hundreds of thousands of years. And it's basically all the saints, the gurus, the yogis, they all get together and they live uh, just like this whole tradition of, uh, of uh, devotion and service. And so they're very extreme. We would wake up at 3.30 in the morning. It was really intense. Uh, I really wanted to learn uh, more about yoga and stuff. And so they guided us over to this uh, Brahmachari, who is the, the main yoga teacher of all the yogis. Like This is like top of the line yoga. <laughs> world. And so... I went to him. It was like a 60-year-old man. He's, uh, dr he's dressed in the same vestibule as uh, Jesus. You know, he wears his white thing, these sandals. And he's, he lives a life of purity. He doesn't eat salt, no sugar. You know, has never uh, made love to a woman. And uh, he's never contaminated his body, you know. And uh, he told me, while, while my friends and I were over there, we were smoking hash with, uh, with the yogis. So that's something that they don't tell you in the books. <laughs> Um, I, ha I had read a book called Autobiography of a Yogi, which mm -hmm. uh, by Paramahansa Yogananda. Yeah, that's I, a good I book. It. You read it? Yeah. And, uh, I finished reading that book as I was landing in India, mm -hmm. and then I went and lived the experience, the actual experience with the same sect of monks. Uh, and so I just learned through their natural pastime that they smoke a lot of hash. And uh, the Brahmachari didn't smoke, but I think for him to get rid of the habit for us, he told us, okay, uh, I'll teach you yoga if you come here every single day at 4 a.m. and you smoke hash with me. And I were like, okay, that's pretty easy. We can do that. <laughs> <laughs> and so my my friends, my three other friends and I, we went over there every single morning. Uh, and he would smoke like to the point where we wanted to give up. We're like, dude, like stop. Like, let's just get to the yoga. Like, this is a lot of smoking. It's just, it's too much. And, uh, and he was doing it on purpose, you know, to de defeat our minds into it. And so uh, he, he was even the, the yoga teacher for the Indian military. I remember one day a, a military guy comes up with a machine gun. And in India, you're not allowed to have guns. So it's kind of weird to see someone with a gun. And then we're, I told the Brahmachari, uh, there's a guy there with a gun, like a soldier. And I think he's like, oh, it's okay. He's all right. He's all right. And I was like, okay. And so he picks us up. We go to the Indian military. Uh, and we're in front of 500 soldiers right in the front. And uh, this Brahmachari, he has like supernatural powers. He can lift himself up with one hand. And uh, he's super strong like a bear. Um, but while I was going through that whole experience of uh, in India, I, I was sitting with myself uh, and I was just thinking, 
Um, even though I'm dressed like a monk, I'm hanging out with monks, I'm living in this whole thing with monks. Uh, like there's just, um, it's just, it's just, uh, the same thing. Like I'm just so in my mind, like there's, there has to be something deeper to spirituality than just going through the motions of this. Um, and so in the whole meantime, my dad has uh, always been a big meditator. He's a holistic doctor. And he had met uh, these two uh, women from Tennessee, and they're middle-aged women. Their names are Kali and Bhagavati. They teach a practice called the Ishaya's Ascension. And so um, this whole time, they knew that I was going to India. They were kind of like my meditation teachers, and they were like, okay, well, you have to go, you have to go. And so uh, once I got back, I was like, no, I, I, had, I want to go learn from them. You know, they're like very one-pointed. And... Um, so I decided uh, I'm going to go into their teaching, and their teaching was uh, six months meditation with about 12 to 15 hours a day with your eyes closed. Uh, and the whole teaching with uh, ascension, it's uh, basically, it doesn't matter if you have your eyes closed or your eyes open, but whenever, when you have your eyes closed, what you're seeing through those 12 to 15 hours is just a screen of images and stories just popping up. And so the natural condition of the mind is for you to just be in the story and then try to, and the mind tries to find a solution, but there is no solution. <laughs> story to story. And so the whole teaching is whenever you notice yourself in the story, you uh, introduce these words of praise, gratitude, and love. And, um, and like I said, it doesn't matter whether you're doing it with your eyes open or your eyes closed. And as I'm talking to you guys right now, I'm actively practicing that. <laughs> so what, what are the words? Are there specific mantra or is it you make your own? It's, it's not a mantra. It's like uh, these specific words that they give you. But uh, I, I can't give you the words until you actually take the teaching. Okay. And that's, that's, and that's just because it, it'll ruin the gift. You know, it's like yeah. telling someone what the gift is before Christmas morning. You know? <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. So I, I recommend that you take it and then uh, it will be revealed to you, you know. And so the six month process. Yeah, six months. And uh and so and like you're when, you you're you're essentially keeping your eyes closed. <laughs> I mean I, I can sleep twelve twelve hours a day. So does that mean that I wake up and then the twelve hours that I'm essentially up, I would have my eyes closed and then go back to sleep. No, you have to be conscious. Huh? Yeah, I know, but with your eyes closed is what I'm saying, right? I mean like well, you have to be in the meditative space, so you have to be aware. And right, but let's say, I mean, you have to sleep, or you don't sleep when you're doing this. Yeah, you sleep. Uh, I think after the fourth, fifth month, uh, your body is so rested that you don't really require sleep. So I would find myself walking around at three, four in the morning and bumping into other meditators. I was in a house, I was in a house with fifty people, <laughs> and we were all like awake at random hours, just because we're we're not sleepy, you know, like. And, uh, and you can understand the yogis in India, they're like that also. They, they never sleep, they're never hungry. They just kind of get rid of all these things because you're not exerting energy towards a worldly stuff. Mm -hmm. And uh, and so basically what happens is that you train the mind into going from the pattern of conditioning from story to story to just bringing the attention right back. And ultimately, uh, if you just break down what you are, uh, you're not your body, right? Your body uh, is constantly changing from your when you're a little kid to when you're old. It's just a perpetual change. Your mind is constantly evolving. Your thoughts are always changing. And so really, what are we? Uh, we are attention. But like whatever your attention is, that's what you are. Whatever you focus on grows. And so what you're focusing on here is the stillness, you know, the silence. Uh, and there is stillness in your life. Uh, you may not notice it because the oscillations of the mind are too fast for you to notice that. Are but, we the are we the observer of the mind? Uh, I think it's beyond that. It's beyond like that. pure attention. Like you can't put your finger on it, you know. Mm -hmm. <laughs> and so ultimately, my my teacher, my my I call her my guru, but she doesn't even refer to herself as a guru. She used to be a music teacher before, and she says you can't have music without the space in between the notes. You know, and that's just in, in life. Like you can't have the fullness of the stillness if you're always in the mind. And so um, the reason why I think that there's a lot of people that don't believe in God is because God is uh, without characteristic and without qualities. Um, and so. And when you, you mention God, 
you know, not to become religious, but it's you're speaking of God in a non-religious way, right? In a, yeah. in a non-denominational way, right? It's not yeah. like the Catholics or the this or the that. It's the it's this energy yeah. that is you you know very abstract mm -hmm. that drives us that connects us that I guess you could call it like the universal consciousness mm -hmm. if the so if the, you yeah there's many words for it like some people yeah. call it the ascendant the holy spirit some people call it the universe energy like whatever name you want to give that there's a presence there and so if i tell you guys right now describe the room you guys will say oh well there's somebody standing sitting next to me there's a microphone in front of me there's a background there's a couch but the one thing that the mind would fail to mention is the most obvious thing, and that's the space in the room. And without the space, there is no room. Mm -hmm. but, but the mind wouldn't notice the space as, as an object because it has no qualities or characteristics. So uh, when I mention God without this presence, you would have no reality. Like, and that's what all the sacred medicines taught me. And that, that was leading up to like, okay, there's this, there's this, there's this. And then uh, I think the cream of the crop for me was the meditation process of just you willingly putting the mind into stillness and then diving deep into that. And so it's like they said, what you focus on grows. So you, you put six months aside of your life uh, from thinking about worldly stuff and, and things that you have to do. And you're perpetually just coming back to stillness over and over. Uh, eventually, that space begins to grow in your life, and there's uh, there's a huge miracle that happens in that process. There's a it's just it's a divinity in the human spirit in uh, in the body, um, and so basically the same things that I experienced with uh, sacred medicines, I was now experiencing it on my own through uh, meditation without any any medicines. Um, when you go deep into, uh, into meditation around the third or fourth month, you start, uh, going deep, 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 and, uh, you start falling into pools of ecstasy. You just start feeling like, uh, this, this great energy that you're not even conscious of until somebody's waking you up out of it. When they're waking you up out of it, you come out of it and you, and you almost feel irritated that somebody got you out of this very peaceful state. And then you, you start coming back into the world. But the energy that you begin to emit is just uh, just pure unconditional love because that's what you're focusing on. Mm -hmm. So this was a very personal journey, right? This, you know, you 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 get sick. You feel that there's a need to reinvent yourself, or that there's maybe another purpose. And then you you grow this appetite to explore all of these um, you know, very psychedelic, very out of body, very particular experiences that just brought you closer and closer to you know this this omnipotent energy, God, call it whatever you may. And and you just kept going deeper and deeper and add layers and layers of training and experiences. In retrospect, and if you were to be guiding anybody, and please understand that probably the majority of us, and I'm including myself here, are so far from ever being in a position where we could do this because we've allowed ourselves to be just sucked into this, right? This, this composition of mindless work of cogs in a wheel of a system. That's just honestly dreadful that leads to depression and all these medical conditions, um, that I think are, are, you know, killing society in many ways. Um, what, what is, in your mind, the way to, for, for people that seem to be very, very far apart from this, to bridge them, to find a, a way through, uh, is there anything in your mind, and I guess it's a very personal thing, but do you think that there's anything that you could advise that could create an, an, a, a 
a balance that still, you know, allows you to continue living your life, right? It just seems like you took such a big chunk of your life to to dedicate to this journey that it seems so far for 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 any of us in the grind to be able to carve this and and be able to do all these things. So so what's your thoughts when when people like me come to you and say, "Hey, what can we do? What can we yeah. do to do?" Well, uh, it's like one of my teachers Bhagavati says that the pull of the world is strong. So when we're in the world, I'm in the world right now and I can feel the energy. It's very distinct from when I was meditating in those 6 months. And so you're just constantly involved in things and, and with people, situations, problems, and that's fine. Like that, that never stops. Even some of the most holy saints in the world have just lived a whole life of suffering and perpetual misery. It doesn't mean that that's going to go away. What does go away is your ability to cling on to it. And so uh, suffering does happen. You know, it happens to all of us. I think that's the human journey. And uh, the most important thing is to surrender to that. You know, uh, there's a reason why you're living that experience. And it's a blessed experience that you're living that. We, we can't understand it with our minds, but uh, just being surrendered and uh, just, just completely giving yourself into that, that's when, when you uh, cut away the, the suffering. When, you, when you're just surrendered, when something happens, you're like, okay, well, this is what I, I have to live, you know? Um, Instead of going into the mind, you know, the, the mind always goes through a pendulum of like, this is right, this is wrong, I should do this, I shouldn't do that. And we're in, in the world of duality, where it's just perpetual. But then there's uh, what's holding the pendulum, you know, it's just stillness. And so if you bring the mind back to stillness over and over, you start uh, growing that space where it just feels very comforting, it feels very peaceful, regardless of what's going on. And... Um, I remember one meditator that we had, she was an older woman that died of cancer. And she, uh, as she was going through the process, everybody was crying. Everybody was just like feeling miserable that she was about to leave the world. And she knew that she was going to leave. And she says, you know, it's interesting that everybody's uh, sad around me and uh, crying that I'm going to leave this body. But I feel completely at peace with it. You know, I know I'm going through that experience, but I, I feel completely at peace because ultimately, when you do leave this body, there's one thing that does keep going, and that is your pure consciousness, you know? And it's like my teacher colleague would say, if you've gone the past 30 years without uh, focusing in on, on uh, stillness or ascending, what we call it, um, then nothing has really happened, you know? Like, you're just going through the world of changing, which is perpetual. It's always changing. And yet there's one thing out of the whole universe that's unchanging. And until your consciousness reaches that point where you're more set on putting attention to the unchanging, that's when your life really begins to change. And that's when you really find this profound peace in your life, regardless of what's going on. Everything can burn to hell and everything can go into a disaster, but can you find peace within yourself through all of that? And, uh, and once you start doing that, the perspective and the consciousness begins to change. You begin to just see that, uh, what, well, well, my perspective, my, my viewpoint is that it's all a blessing. It's an unconditional blessing. And so even in the harshest miseries that you can face, like, you know, that that's just temporary. Um, and so really like, that's what, that's what I can advise to anybody going through any type of like, uh, suffering that they're going through in their life is just surrender, surrender to that because there's a holiness even in that experience. How do you, you, you know, you seem like a very self-authoring person. You seem like a person that has taken control of their lives. And it comes, you know, it, it manifests itself as business ventures. It manifests itself as we were talking, as you were going to Belize to spend some time over there with your girlfriend. You, you seem to be, uh, you know, have a self-authored life. Uh, that can seem, there can seems there can seem to be a paradox between surrendering, surrendering and being self-authoring, which I think a lot of us want to be self-authoring in our lives. We want to be take, you know, we have, want to have autonomy. And it, can you speak to that between the 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 peace that you find in surrendering uh, to to this life, to this lesson, and then um, the self-actualization and self-authoring in this life? Yeah, um, I think everybody's ego hides in uh, different ways. And in, and uh, I remember my teacher specifically told me in my training that where my ego was hiding, 
nobody would like to hear this when they tell you, you have an ego and this is where it's hiding. She says, you know where your, your ego hides is incompetence. And she says, so whenever you notice yourself that you're being confident about something, just bring the attention right back to stillness, you know? Mm-hmm. And, uh, and what will happen is you drop the cape. And once you completely surrender, when you're having uh, that thought, and, by, and when I mean surrender, when you're having that thought, it's, it's the teaching that I'm following that like, okay, I, feel, I'm, I just noticed that I'm being confident. And then I introduce the words of praise or the praise of, of the, or the words of gratitude. And, uh, and in that moment, I'm allowing that space to grow in my life rather than me be, being in the conditioning of Christensen and his mind and his confidence. Mm-hmm. And she says, and when you drop that cape, the one who will pick it up is the Holy Spirit. And, and she was right about that. Like it, it was just absolutely on, like that's, that's really what it comes down to. If you find yourself in habitual patterns that your mind is doing, you're not your mind. Like it's just, it's just conditioning. And so if, if you notice that and then you come back to stillness, that's what erases the conditioning. And so when I start uh, living that experience and I can see that, uh, you know, I'm, I'm not the doer of my life. I'm really just witnessing my life. And I can keep going through the story. I can keep going through the conditioning, or I can just uh, give that over to the Holy Spirit and, and uh, see where that shows up. And I think it was one of the apostles that said, I think it was John the Apostle. Uh, he says, uh, I must decrease, he must increase. I must decrease, he must increase. And so that's that's what it means, mm. like decreasing yourself mm-hmm. in the mind and then giving that space for the Holy Spirit. And uh, one of my favorite saints that I study from is uh, Ramana Maharshi. I'm not sure if you guys have heard of this guy. Mm-hmm. He's from the 1800s. He just, from the age of 13, he just went off and meditated in one spot for his whole life until he died. <laughs> and, uh, and he said something very poignant that said, the highest level of intellect is devotion. And, and I truly believe that. Like you're, All the sacred medicines will take you to that. All the meditation will take you to that. The highest level of intellect is devotion. You start getting, oh, this, oh, that, oh, that. The mind keeps climbing, climbing, climbing until you realize that you're just here uh, to praise God, you know, or praise the universe, praise stillness. Um, and once you, your consciousness does reach that point, it's like, well, what, what else matters if you're always engulfed in this unconditional love? You can do no wrong. Nothing wrong uh, can happen to you. Even though you're perceiving that, your body and your mind go through the experience, but you're engulfed in this unconditional blessing and unconditional love. And so when you're surrendered to that, your life does start changing. You know, you start. What does praising God mean? Because I think in the Western world, we have a very particular narrow view of it. And I think you might be touching something different. Okay. I think it's just uh, uh, attention, bare attention. Uh, my teacher's teacher, he was a monk called uh, MSI. Uh, and he would say, uh, his, his name is Maharishi Shiva Ishaya. That was his full name. Uh, and he would say, uh, bare attention equals absent intention. You know, when your attention is bare on stillness, the mind can't go into an intention. Okay, I'm going to be more devoted. I'm going to be more spiritual. I'm going to mm-hmm. do this, do that. There's none of that. It's just like, it's just simple. Um, and it's kind of, you go back into the mind of a child. It's like, it's innocent. And so after the six months of meditation, what happens is that like your mind doesn't think, it's just still, and then you feel like, this is how I felt. I was, I told my teacher, I feel really dumb now. <laughs> I feel like my mind can't even think. I can't, it's not complex, like the way that I would dig into stuff before. It's just very uh, plain. And then all, all, all of a sudden, somebody would speak to me and ask me something, and then boom, I, I would speak, and it was just so powerful. But it's not like I had planned that or rehearsed that. It was just already there. And so I think when you when you surrender completely uh, to this to the Holy Spirit and to stillness, you'll see that all the power and all the all the things that you were looking for are actually just right there at your reach. Christensen, do you think that <clears throat> psychedelics are just mere tools to unlock? the power of the mind, the spirit, and that once you do a certain amount of of these journeys, that you may get to a very enlightened moment where then the need of such tools becomes irrelevant. Mm-hmm. Or, on the counter, 
are psychedelics an ongoing need and tool that throughout your life you have to revisit, you know, almost to the point that it becomes, you know, a, a, a reboot. Yeah, like the, the the certain. I'm not saying necessarily as a as a uh, that, that, that hey, I'm gonna go and and get some shrooms and go tonight to a bar. Right? <laughs> that, that's so dumb. Like I'm talking about the need for this purposeful journey that comes from this. Is it an unlocked power of the mind connection, and then you don't have to, or are there multiple chapters and layers? that through these experiences multiple times throughout your life allow you to reach new levels? What's your thought? Well, I do want to compartmentalize the medical aspect of the, the sacred medicines and then the spiritual aspect. The spiritual aspect was just something that clicked in me. Um, and not everybody has that journey. I've met a lot of people who do sacred medicines who just say, oh, aha, okay, that's it. And then they keep going with their normal life. So there's no like, reach you know like one of my favorite paintings is the creation by michelangelo have you guys seen it with the finger mm -hmm. yes well it symbolizes just like the spirit of, of uh, the human where you're so close to that you're so close to the holy spirit and to to this uh, light but you won't make that little effort that little reach and that's all it takes it's it's not a lot um and there's a lot of people i met in mexico that would do peyote mushrooms and They just keep the, they'll just keep going on their journey, you know, and maybe it's not uh, their time yet. But in terms of the medical aspect, uh, the peyote, it's uh, it's very alkaline. It's the most alkaline thing you're ever going to taste. It's like an alien alkaline drug, <laughs> and uh, <laughs> you you go into the desert, and in the desert, um, and it's very protected in Mexico. So uh, it's it's not like the easiest thing to find. You have to go scavenge for it, and you have to have a local help you out and look for it. And so first you have to look for it. When you find it, you have to cut off the little hairs on top because they're poisonous. A peyote takes about a hundred years to grow. So it's very wow. sacred. Oh, wow. And you need to uh, eat like two or three, uh, depending on the size. There, there's some tiny ones like this, and then there's some big ones like that. And, and it's a different experience taking both of them. Uh, they call it the grandfather. Uh, and so it has a, a very masculine energy. And uh, what it does is it changes the perception of colors, but it also has this uh, downloading frequency of, uh, of fearlessness. Uh, I'm not sure if I told you, uh, Doc, but uh, when, when I first did peyote, I remember we were going down on horses from 9,000 feet up in elevation down the mountain. And these horses were walking right on the edge. And my friend and I were like, oh, no, like, this is too close. Like, I can, I can see my death down there. <laughs> so, and so we're like, man, this is scary. And so we get down to the desert. We eat the peyote. And as we're climbing, oh, when we're going down, the, the, the tour guide, the cowboy, he tells us, oh, don't worry. The horse is not going to fall. You better hold on because you can fall, but not the horse. <laughs> and so we're, as we're climbing up, when we're, we've taken the peyote, we're, we're the ones looking down and zero fearlessness of death. It's just like, it's a piece that encompasses you that you know that everything's okay, regardless if you go through death. Like, who cares? Um, and so I, I think it's very alkalinizing. I think it's... Uh, You know, disease can grow in an alkalinized environment. And so I think it's, it's a very good method to uh, heal the body. Um, the other one is the, the holy mushrooms. Uh, they grow down there in Oaxaca uh, during uh, the rainy season only. Um, and so the, uh, the same, you have little ones, which are called the family. They grow in a little bunch. And then you have two of them that grow with the family. And these are called the masters. So the family will give you an experience of... Uh, It's very intense, very quick. It can last about three to five hours. And at the end, uh, your perception changes and it looks like you're in a snow white reality, like a Disney reality when you open your eyes. And it's a very clean and motivating and anti-depressing uh, thing to take. And I took several people down there uh, for uh, that, were, that would just call me and tell me, hey, I'm, I'm depressed. Even, even one of my meditators, it was a older woman who was 78 years old who went through the six-month uh, meditation journey with me. She always suffered through depression. She was always lonely. So I told her, hey, how about you come over here to, uh, to Mexico with me and I'll, and I'll guide you through the ceremony. There's no specific shaman for the mushrooms. And so I would have to uh, play that part. 
And so anytime somebody would take the mushrooms, I would take it with them. And then as soon as they would kick in, I thought like, oh, not only are they going through their healing, I'm also going through the healing. (laughs) (laughs) It's like, oh, crap, I'm going through this again. (laughs) And it's very intense. And uh, the masters, the big ones, those you you can stay in for 8 to 12 hours and it comes in waves where you feel like, okay, it's gone. And boom, it it takes you back into it. And and just the lesson of those is uh, unconditional love. It's like a, a mastery. And the only way that you get out of it is uh, surrender. That you just surrender that, okay, it's going to keep dragging me back in and it's going to keep showing me this thing. After I took her, she, oh, and I had a, a doctor from Taiwan even go to one of my retreats. Uh, yeah, when she uh, ended up taking the, the medicine, I told her, just take it, you know, just like as you would uh, prescribe to your patients. They have to take the medicine in order to get better. And so she was very quiet the whole time. She had told me that the uh, original purpose of her trip was to uh, do research, you know. But when mm-hmm. she when she took the the drink, she uh, I remember she got up on the mountain and she yelled and she's like, "I can talk, I can talk!" Like she was just yelling yeah. at the top of her lungs. And so um, ultimately, what happened was that my my friend, the meditator, and other people they ended up getting treated for depression. Mm-hmm. Um, uh, and they call they call they refer to that in Mexico as the holy children, the mushrooms. Um, then when I went to, to the Amazon, that's the ayahuasca, also very alkaline, uh, and they call it the grandmother because it can, it can be very punishing, but at the same time, it, uh, at the very end of the ceremony, it's very loving. And, and I, I was, and with that one, that was the best shamanic experience that I had because you have several shamans going around in a circle and they're all uh, singing these chants. Uh, and w- which are chants that they download when they're going through their study of, uh, of ayahuasca. And the, the cycle of study for a shaman in, in South America is that they go about six months with uh, just eating a piece of fish and a green banana as their meal for the day. And then they, they boil a tea of whatever plant they want to study and they just drink that plant, uh, the tea. And uh, the the shamans told me that the, the plant itself will tell you how much to take and what it's for. And uh, so there's many shamans that have different studies of different plants, which I think there's one shaman in Ecuador that has studied like 900 to 1,200 plants. And uh, the ones we had were about 500 uh, plants studied. So we, we got a very good experience. Um, but like I said, uh, uh, during my ceremonies, I even remember in, uh, I did five ceremonies of ayahuasca and I went with my brother and another friend. And at this point, we already knew how to ascend. We knew how to, to meditate. And so I remember telling them, look, this is our, our last ceremony. Let's just focus on God. Do whatever you perceive, just focus on, on stillness. And so anytime you feel something exalted, you, you bring the attention right back to stillness. And then you f- see something that you've never seen before and you bring it right back and so I think that made the whole experience even more holy for me. Um, and then it, it almost like ayahuasca, it goes into your mind and it inspects your subconscious like, an, like a real live energy. And it's almost like it allows you access to different realms as you're going through that. And uh, in my final ceremony, I began to see uh, the teaching of, a, of another doctor in another dimension that was teaching me what pure perfection was, like just precise perfection I, I can't even put words to it <laughs> and so just going through all of that um i really enjoyed traveling and i i told myself you know what i, I want to get paid to travel like that's ultimately <laughs> what would i do with my money i would use it on traveling <laughs> yeah. and so i thought i'm going to create this company called the, the sacred healing center and i'm going to take people around the world and i'm going i'm going to travel with them i'm going to uh, uh partake in these sacred medicines and as I as I started doing that, I remember uh, my my teacher Kali. She's uh, I, I see her as an as an angel in the world. Like she's a very clear person to speak to. And whenever she gives me advice, she tells me, "Well, I'm just one mirror." And I tell her, "Yeah, Kali, but you're a very clear mirror. Like what you say is just like pr- pristine information." And so, uh, are you guys uh, okay? My baby. Yeah, yeah, we're here. No, we're we're just listening. And so you know, we're um, here. I, I actually would like to, I love that. That was my first question to talk about the company. It took us almost an hour to get there, <laughs> yeah. but, but that's, 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 this, this is really, really, um, 
very interesting. I, I want to know, um, you know, a little bit about this, this company. So, you know, what, what was the purpose? Who would, who would be the client? Where would you take them? You know, did you have multiple places depending on what particular journey they needed or what they were interested in doing? How was the, where were you operating the company from, et cetera? Mm -hmm. Well, uh, everything is operated online. Uh, we we just uh, set up retreats, whether they're uh, meditation, yoga. Oh, wait, this company is still is still uh, ongoing. Oh well, I'm actually going to start it uh, right back up. Uh, oh, because I thought it was out. Was it COVID? Like, yeah, it was know, COVID. It was basically like nobody can travel around the world, so it was like, okay, well, there goes my company. <laughs> <laughs> and so, okay, um, so so you're you're considering restarting the company. This is great. Yeah, okay. definitely. I, I think uh, in this following year, we're already setting up uh, several retreats. Uh, okay. I do want to focus more on the meditation aspect of it because uh, after consulting with my teacher colleague, she told me that. Um, she doesn't think it's a very wise decision to take people who have no um, no knowledge of stillness or or the Holy Spirit or the Ascendant and taking them into sacred medicines and and teaching them that that's the truth, which is it's not you know it's it's more like stepping stones, um, and so uh, and also again in in Mexico these these uh, the people in Mexico. They don't like for foreigners to come in and start like taking their their medicines and all that. Um, and the, my thinking about it is that not everybody wants to do sacred medicines. There's a very small percentage of people who actually want to do that. Um, but the few people that do, I take small groups. Uh, I keep it all under wraps. I don't uh, market it a lot. And uh, and I just teach them uh, of, of these experiences, how much to take and and how to take it. And uh, ultimately, uh, my highest recommendation and suggestion is to uh, uh, take it to a devotional practice. You know, whatever that is, whatever path that you're on, just raise the devotion in your life. And I think that that will give you a very good foundation uh, going into the sacred medicines. Yeah, is it devotion towards something? Or? Well, as we talked, we 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 discussed devotion briefly before, which is the practice of going into stillness. No, okay. it's kind of that that what what I understood. It's just like again coming into trying to to understand the observer of your mind in a sense. If if you could put it in a very simple way, mm -hmm. you know, I think yeah, well, you could. Yeah, there like uh, you know, there's people who are Muslim. There's people who are Christian, um, and there's uh, Jewish people. Like uh, everybody has their own path, and I think uh, ultimately something that Paramahansa Yogananda said is that all rivers eventually lead back to the ocean. You know, mm -hmm. It doesn't really matter what path you're on. What matters is that you're making that concentrated effort to finding out what truth is for you and in your life. And uh, I think all the sacred medicines pointed the way they revealed a little bit to, to me along the way. Uh, but ultimately, the truest teaching is the one that points the finger back at your own heart. And going internally and going deep into that, I think that that's where where it's all at, you know. And I, I'd be misleading you if I told you, "Oh, go do peyote and you're going to be enlightened," or "Go do ayahuasca and you're going to be a, a master of truth." It's just not not it. And um, but what is it is if you go internally, you sit with yourself and you chisel away at your conditioning and you try to work on that attention, on the active attention, which is always moving around endlessly. And then, uh, you know, putting it in stillness. And so the, the Naga Babas that I studied with in India, they practice contemplation where they just sit around and they contemplate God, you know. And so uh, there's many different teachings, but ultimately when you're making that concentrated effort, I think you're making some progress into the spiritual journey of life. Yeah, I want to go back to something you mentioned, which I, I found very interesting. And I, and I found it to be kind of true in my own life. Do you know about the the Ramayana? Have you uh, heard of the, the the book of Rama? Rama, yeah, I think I've heard something about it. I yeah, I found I read the story. I forget. I think I think I read it in this other book called The Cosmic Serpent. And the story is that there was the author uh, of the book of, and I looked it up because I don't want to like butcher the names. But the author was this basically a, a highway robber. Uh, and at one point he repented on his ways and then went under a tree uh, and then 
started meditating and just saying a mantra. And the mantra was Rama, which I think in Sanskrit means God. So he did that for years. And then after that, he you know got this information download that became the book of Rama. Uh, and in the cosmic serpent, you know, the, there are, there's some really interesting stories in medicine, how, how these practices converge with medicine. Um, there are some of the Vera, Vera, uh, one of the Rokuroniums uh, to paralyze patients in the OR. Mm-hmm. That comes from the Amazon. Uh, and it comes from the venom of toads. But it's not just the way, and the way that it was discovered is because the uh, native people uh, wanted to get food and they wanted to kill monkeys in the trees. But if you shoot an arrow at a monkey and it dies, it curls its tail as it dies in the tree and doesn't fall. So what they do is they put this venom of this toad on the arrow and shoot it and that it paralyzes the monkey as it dies and then it falls into the ground and you can eat it, right? So flaccid paralysis. Yeah, you mean. but it, exactly. Mm-hmm. But it's to do that, it's not just you rub the arrow on the toad. You have to like do like cook it for like 23 hours to change it chemically into the compound that will do that. Uh, and it's a mystery. So how did, how did these people learn that that was the process to get to that? And uh, this book was called The Cosmic Ser- Serpent. The anthropologist wrote it. And there's other examples of things like this. Uh, told them that, you know, spirit told, told the, the shamans in an ayahuasca ceremony. So spirit, so the universe gave these people a download of information that told them that if you get this toad venom and you cook it for 23 hours and then you rub it on an arrow, you'll be able to shoot a monkey and eat it. So, and I found myself, like I'm like a meditation amateur at best. I'm a dabbler. Um, But I found myself that when I do, you know, I have a backyard and I just go into my backyard and, and just stare at trees. And when I do that and I concentrate on a problem uh, and then just, you know, think of the problem, but there's just, just concentrate on stillness, you know, these, these downloads of information come and they can come from very simple ways for me. It's just like, oh, I should send this email or I should do this thing. Uh, but there is, there is a, something in the process of achieving stillness and then bringing it into the world, into real concrete things. And I just find that very interesting. I don't know if you have any examples about that um yeah well i think it's important for every aspiring student to get a good teacher you know and uh like in india they have the traditions and customs of having your guru and uh, i think i was just very blessed enough to find uh, these middle-aged women from tennessee they 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 don't look like gurus or like uh, yogis <laughs> or anything they dress like just very basic you know um but they're very devoted you know they're very devoted and so uh, there's two types of people of devotion. There's the gyanis, which are that of the intellect, where you want to discover more and more. And then there's uh, those of the bhaktis, and the bhaktis are simply those who practice devotion without having to know anything, kind of like a, a Mother mm. Teresa type. And so it doesn't matter what style you are. I think what's important is that you're making that concentrated effort. And what a guru does or a teacher does is it helps you discern uh, what's truth and what's not. And so... The guru is always the one guiding you to put your attention on what doesn't change. And so while we were all going through this meditation experience, uh, one of the people that was going through uh, a difficult time with this was my my father. He he actually went through the through the meditation retreat with me, and he had been a meditator for about forty years, uh, just constantly meditating every single day for several hours. And so uh, my father just started getting a lot of exalted experiences while we were in the meditation retreat. And, uh, and so he said, no, I saw these brilliant, bright colors. I saw uh, all these things. I experienced this in my nervous system. And my teacher, Kali, would always point him back to like, well, is that, is that happening right now? And then she said, he said, no, that's not happening right now. And she says, well, that's not it, you know, because uh, the unchanging happens when... Uh, those exalted experiences happen or when it's uh, completely mundane. So um, I remember one time I had a dream and my, my, uh, in this dream, my, both my teachers, Bhagavati and Kali would show up. And then Bhagavati says uh, in the dream, she says, what is the same? And then, uh, and my teacher Kali would say, if it's, if it's not here now, that's not it. 
And then Bhagavati would say, what is the same? And then Kali would say, if it's not here now, that's not it. And I had like an eight hour dream of them repeating <laughs> this because they, they, <laughs> they would repeat this in every single meeting and, and they just drilled it into my mind that like the way that you find truth is with those two elements. Like what is the same in this experience right now that we're having and speaking to each other? And when you're in the middle of a sacred uh, shamanic ceremony mm. um, and um and if it's not here now, that's not it. Meaning that like, if you're having an exalted experience right now, well, are you, are you having it right now? Well, no, the answer is no. So, you know, truth is not the exalted experience, but truth is right here. And it's a, it's very basic. It's, uh, it's innocent and it's really a state of consciousness and the state of consciousness of the ascendant is I don't know this, you know, it's so innocent that you don't know, like you don't know anything that you don't know what's going to happen 15 minutes from now. You don't know what happened 15 seconds ago. <laughs> and so it's really, I don't know this. And that's, that's the innocence, which is a pristine consciousness here in, on in the human life, you know, and there's really nothing to search for and nothing to patch up. Uh, it's not about moving yourself into a better experience. It's really about, uh, living presently, presently here, being surrendered and uh, surrendering. Beautiful. Well, I think, <clears throat> Christians and a lot of people that, I mean, I, I for one, um, and I'm sure Lucas also, and, and probably a lot more out there, will find your journey very inspirational. Um, and, and I think it's going to, Develop a lot of curiosity. I'm very curious right, about right. All, a lot of some things that right, a lot right, of like inspirational, said, yeah. but also engaging and maybe even catalytic. Yeah, would be the right word. The, that's probably the right word. Which is, hopefully, it's a catalyst to consider. You know the this this well, journey of stillness. Look, looking right? inside, yeah. Look yeah inside. Look inside. Find find this power, this energy, and. Uh, you know, probably, hopefully, maybe through you know, multiple efforts of introspection of, uh, yeah, in yeah, and yoga, I'm, inspiration. I mean, yeah. it's, I, mean I, I think it, like, the, you know, we go, when we go to work, you know, we go to battle with problems. Um, but there's, there's also, like, a battle inside. There, there's also, like, a, a, a search uh, uh, a meaning, a, a process inside. So, uh, and that's also super interesting. Yeah. That's probably way more interesting than than the external world. world. And, and 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 I'll I'll say this also, Christensen. We've had a lot of speakers here. Actually, this 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 uh, this turn where we were talking about burnout. Um, we we're talking about the urge to do career path changes and realize. Um, and, and all of that was hyper-focused on, well, what's the next step? Okay. If I don't want to be a doctor, you know, what can I do with my skills and this, and it's interesting because it's this mad race, uh, to continue the Where, grind. Yeah, exactly. To continue, to continue the, the grind. To continue yeah. this grind to yeah. then, you know, if you, if you've, if you've burned and so it, instead of which is, I think, a really interesting perspective here. Which is, how about you just stop? Yeah. And how about you? How about, you know? Could this urge be just a, a urge to soothe your own needs? Yeah. Without necessarily having to stop being who you are, or to change a professional direction completely. Like maybe all you need is stillness. Yeah. Yeah, and, and it's very simple things that that you grasp. Um, in a moment, like, you know, Courtney to told me once, and that this is like an amazing thought experiment. It's like, you know, when, think of a time where you haven't had enough. Think of one time in your life where you, like right now, we have enough. Right now, we have all we need. Do too much, too much. Yeah. So try to think of a time. So when you, you're, you're grasping at things externally, just think, okay, do I have enough right now? And the answer I've always found to be yes. <laughs> like right now, at this moment, in this present moment, I have enough. Yeah. 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 Christensen, I'll give you the last words. If you want to wrap us up, I know that we could speak for hours and hopefully you'll come again and we'll talk about different stuff. 
Yeah, you'll tell us about how successful the company is going and how many people's lives you've touched now with this new spin and focus on it. But, and I, uh, I would love to go to a meditation retreat. Actually. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Well, we'll, we'll probably we'll probably come down and, and join you. But uh, but you want to wrap up the today's hour? Yeah, definitely. Well, uh, um, the way that I I would like to end this is by saying that everything and in, uh, in this world and all your concentrated efforts will always lead to diminishing return. Just like when you crave an ice cream, you crave it in the mind and then you go out and you live the action of going and buying this ice cream and you go and you taste it. And the first bite, it's fulfilling. The second bite, a little bit less fulfilling. The third bite, you start reaching a diminishing return and it's just not giving you that kick that you want. And so the mind jumps over to the next experience that uh, you feel like you're going to find fulfillment and so this is your whole life. You're just living diminishing return after diminishing return until consciousness reaches a point where it gets to the one thing in the whole universe that doesn't have diminishing return, and that is devotion. That is the love for God. And so there have been many masters who have come into the world and have taught this. I've read so many books about it, and I was tired of reading the books. I wanted to live mm -hmm. it for myself. And so in living for, for myself and this experience, it's true what they say. It's very true. And so if you just make a little bit of concentrated effort into that, see for yourself if that will lead to diminishing return. And I promise you it won't. It will lead you to truth. And from truth is a very strong foundation for you to restart your life in. Then you can continue being a doctor. You can continue being the homeless man. You can continue doing whatever it is because it's not in your choosing to live this experience. That's the choosing of God. And your only job is to say thank you. Amazing. All right. Thank you and so that, much, Christensen. That's we'll, amazing. We'll wrap it up and we appreciate your time. And, and uh, where can people find you where for this meditation retreats? Um, I'm about to set the, the website up again, but at the sacredhealingcenter.com. I'll put some contacts up there and uh, I'll also put my schedule for the year. It'll probably be up in the next two weeks. And so uh, there'll be meditation, yoga, and sacred medicine retreats. All right. Beautiful. Well, I feel super, super light. <laughs> even just having a conversation with you so thank you and uh, we'll be in touch alright All right. thank you guys for inviting me it was a pleasure speaking with you both thank you okay man bye, -bye. God bless bye. two vascular surgeons walk into a bar and come out with a podcast we are talking everything vascular and not welcome to the life of flow podcast podcast